Well, against the backdrop of the crisis in Gaza lies the conduct of Iran. Now, we all know about the close ties between the Shia theocracy in Tehran and Shia Hezbollah in Lebanon. But what's the nature of Tehran's relations with Sunni Hamas, which of course carried out the terror attacks on Israel earlier this month? Elliot Abrams is a senior fellow for Middle Eastern Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations, and he served as a deputy national security advisor in the George W. Bush administration. He's in Australia this week as a guest of AJAC. Elliot, welcome to the program. Thanks. Glad to do it. Now, to what extent is Iran in cahoots with Hamas? Totally. It's not possible for Hamas to do this kind of October 7th attack without Iran. For one thing, they finance it. They give Hamas about 150 to $200 million a year. So there would be no Hamas of this sort without Iranian support. Iranian training in Lebanon by Hezbollah, Iranian weaponry, Iranian planning. It would be a much smaller, less competent outfit if it weren't for Iran. This is awfully confusing because Iran did play a role in supporting the Shia militia groups like Hezbollah in defeating the Sunni Islamic State in both Iraq and in Syria. So how do you account for Iran, Shia Muslim, uh, playing a key role in aiding and abetting Sunni Hamas? I think they're helping the Shia groups and not the Sunni groups where they are in competition and where um, Iran has a role in that competition. So Lebanon, which is divided, Shia Sunni Christian, or Iraq, Sunni Shia. They want their side, the Shia, to win, not the Sunnis. But uh, when it comes to Palestinians, there are almost no Shias. They're all Sunni. I remember when I was in the White House 20 years ago, we actually debated, would Iran ever give any help to Hamas and Islamic Jihad because they're all Sunni? Well, the answer is yes, because in that theater, they're not worried about Sunni Shia rivalries. They just want to try to help destroy the state of Israel. So they support Sunni groups that want to do that. And yet Sunni Saudi Arabia, the Sunni Gulf states, have been trying to normalize relations with Israel because they're more worried about Shia Iran. That's right. Um, That's what I was saying before. I mean, in in places like Lebanon and uh, Iraq, Iran is supporting the Shia groups. And in the Gulf, uh, all the Sunni states, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, uh, know it. And they have their own interests there in pushing back against those uh, terrorist groups and against Iran. Iran is their greatest security threat. On the here and now of Gaza, do you believe that the Israeli objective of destroying Hamas is achievable? Yes. I I mean, I guess there's a definition question. If you mean destroying an idea, no. If you mean destroying Hamas uh, as a military organization capable of attacking Israel and imposing these horrible, brutal, savage attacks, yeah, that can be done. That is a military objective, and it can certainly be done. The question is, at what cost that might come? How can Israel justify ordering more than a million people, more than a million people, to leave their homes in war in a place as congested and damaged as the Gaza Strip? I would say, how could Israel not do that? It appears there's going to be street-to-street fighting in northern Gaza. So the laws of war tell you not to attack civilians and to try to get civilians out of the way. Israel's been doing this for years and years, sometimes building by building, so-called knock on the roof to tell people this building has Hamas facilities, get out of it, because it's going to be bombed. Here they're saying to Gazans, there's going to be a war in northern Gaza, get out of the way. Uh, That's complying with the laws of war to try to get civilians out of the way of the war. Your skeptics would say, isn't the reality, though, that if you are trying to pursue Hamas in the Gaza Strip, home to two million people, very congested area, if if, if, if Israel wants to do all that with the level of ferocity uh, that the Netanyahu government is promising it will conduct in its campaign, isn't it, isn't it the reality that a very large number of people who have nothing to do with Hamas will inevitably suffer and die? I think that that is right. And every single one of those deaths 
is on the hand of Hamas, which provoked this war. If you say that Israel cannot go into Gaza at all because it's heavily populated, then you are saying that Hamas has the right, has the ability to go and do again the savage, the unbelievable, the medieval activities that it did on October 7th. The laws of war do not require that. They do not require that. Even sieges are not against the laws of war. They require that you try to avoid civilian casualties and you try to tell civilians to get out of the way. Obviously, Hamas doesn't care. In fact, we've seen in the last week Hamas telling people from northern Gaza, don't leave your homes. Don't go to find safety. They've even tried to block the roads. Nor is the passage to Egypt open. But the laws of war do not require that Israel sit there and be savaged and see babies killed while it does nothing. Hamas knew this. It treats the people of Gaza as cannon fodder. That is a war crime. Yeah, again, your critics would say that the decision to turn off all the power in Gaza, all the water to the Gaza Strip, without electricity, the hospitals, they risk turning into morgues. Well, uh, the water has, I gather, been uh, turned on. But I would say there's a difference between interfering with, for example, bombing a power plant and electric lines and a water purification plant and having to supply it. I don't remember that the Allies in World War II thought they were obliged to supply water and electricity and food to Germany in the course of the war. Israel is going to cooperate with these humanitarian efforts. I wish Egypt would cooperate more because, you know, Israel doesn't have Gaza surrounded. There is a border with Egypt. Why isn't it open? So that Gazans can get out and so that food can get in. The last time I looked, there were miles and miles of trucks lined up to bring food into Gaza and the Egyptian border wasn't open. That's inexcusable. Let's bring this conversation back to Shia Tehran. Now, the Iranians, according to various news sources, have threatened that if the Hamas-Israel war is further escalated, Iran will have to intervene. What do you think intervene means? Well, I think none of us really know. Um, It's a threat, obviously. Uh, It could mean as little as urging Hezbollah to make more trouble on the northern border as they've been doing in the last week. At the other end of the spectrum, a full-scale attack by Hezbollah. And that's why President Biden acted. I mean, that's the purpose of having two carrier task forces in the Mediterranean to say to Iran and Hezbollah, if you try that, you risk the involvement of the United States. So Iran is, in a sense, threatening, and the United States is threatening back. Let me put to you what I put to another uh, prominent scholar of Middle Eastern affairs, Daniel Pipes, on this program, that across the Middle East, there is evident strong pro-Palestinian sentiment in street protests and social media. What's the likely response from the Saudis and those Sunni Gulf states? After all, just a few weeks ago, Saudi Arabia seemed to be on the brink of normalizing relations with Israel. I would distinguish between the ones that basically have no population, that, you know, are mostly expats living there, like the Emirates. I distinguish them from Saudi Arabia, 35 million people. Though it is an autocracy, there is public opinion. And I think what this war means is that the normalization is off for, you know, we're guessing a year, two years. The Saudis can't move forward with it, not only during the war, but I think for some time after the war. It makes sense for the Saudis. So, I think sooner or later it will happen, but uh, it certainly won't happen sooner at this point. We've just passed the 30th anniversary of the Oslo Peace Accords. Who can forget those famous images of President Bill Clinton on the White House lawn with the leaders of the Palestinian organisation Yasser Arafat and the Prime Minister of Israel, Rabin? Um, Since then, the narrative has been a a two-state solution. If that looks impossible now, which I think is the overwhelming consensus, what's the alternative? Well, I'll give you an answer. A lot of people won't accept it. But for the West Bank, you know, from 48 to 67, it was ruled by Jordan. There are many ties to Jordan. I don't really see why it is impossible to think of a Palestinian, let's say, entity that is linked in a kind of confederation with Jordan. There is a question now after this war, who will fight terrorism? Who will prevent something like October 7th from happening? You have to answer that question before you even talk about Palestinian statehood. 
And for the West Bank, maybe the answer is the Jordanians. For Gaza, I think, really, we don't know. No one had been thinking about the situation we find ourselves in now. And I think President Biden should be talking to the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Qataris, who are going to have to pay for reconstruction, talking to the Egyptians, uh, talking to the UN, because I don't know, can one envision a kind of consortium that would help rule Gaza, obviously with the with the participation of the Palestinian authority as well. Someone has to govern Gaza when this war is over. And uh, n- no one really has a plan at this point. So I hope that behind the scenes, they are working on it. Okay. Well, just looking at where we are now, Elliot, and, and of course, you know, the, there is the, the specter of Iranian-backed Hezbollah getting involved in northern Israel. How high is the risk of a regional conflict spreading? I would still bet against it, but the risk is high. It would not, I think, go beyond Israel, Hezbollah. I can't see Iran getting directly involved because that would probably bring in the United States. But there is certainly a real risk that Hezbollah decides that while Israel is involved in a war in Gaza, this is the time when they should attack. You can't give numbers. Is it 60-40 or 40-60? I'd still bet against it because I think Hezbollah is Iran's deterrent against an Israeli attack on the Iranian nuclear program. And they want that deterrent to survive and be in place. But it's it's a very volatile and dangerous situation. Final question. Um, Just turning this back to the United States, obviously in the course of the last uh, fortnight, um, President Biden, uh, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, they've all paid these visits to Jerusalem, solidarity with the Israeli government. Is there not less of an appetite for America at home uh, to play the kind of dominant role on the world stage, exercising, you know, global leadership in a unipolar world? Is there not less of an appetite for that role because of a failure of US interventionism in the Middle East uh, since September 11? Um, I think there's something to that. By the end, certainly the Iraq war and the Afghanistan war were very unpopular and considered to be mistakes. But on the other hand, there is enormous support for Israel in the United States. The strongest uh, pillar of that support is the 100 million evangelical Christians in the United States. So I think Israel is considered uh, differently from other countries, and everybody is reeling from the savagery of this attack on October 7th. So I think, yeah, Americans are worried about being overcommitted overseas. But again, high, high support levels for Israel. Elliot, great to have you on the program. My pleasure. Elliot Abrams, who served in key foreign policy positions in the Reagan, George W. Bush and Trump administrations. 